Right. So um, the topic of this, I'm going to be the moderator uh, for this session, and uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to talk about discuss interacting uh, uh, phases, invertible phases of quantum matter, and I changed the title from short range entangled because first of all, short range entangled sort of not exactly a well defined thing because every, some people mean different people mean, mean, mean different things by this, while uh, invertible phase is a uh, 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 a bit more clear because well, I'll explain what sense I mean this, but uh, that's something a bit well, more well defined. And I'd like to start with some remarks, which I actually want to uh, first of all develop on some of the things that Lukas said. First of all, uh, so I like very much this quantum information approach to classifying phases, and I would like to argue that in fact uh, it's it is actually better than what Lukas said in the sense that we do have we sort of start seeing the beginning of a uh, 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 mathematical or rigorous mathematical approach to this to this uh, quantum information uh, methods uh, application to kind uh, matter systems. So, in some some rigorous results are already appearing. But let me just first emphasize that lots of people in this uh, workshop um, are have been working on um, uh, phases of preformians, on gap phases of preformians, and I'd like to emphasize the difference and the new challenges that interacting case uh, presents. So, uh, so when you have gap, uh, you have a, a system of non-free means non-interacting, right? And the gapped and free together, we'll see it's basically the same as invertible and free. So there's no need to distinguish between invertible and gapped in this particular case. But anyway, so that means you say in this simple case when you have a say say U1 symmetry, the problem that means you're studying Hamiltonians uh, of this sort. And I'm not assuming in translational symmetry. So I'm assuming that my si I have some lattice in D dimensions. So let's call lambda. Some infinite set, no accumulation point. Technically, it's not known as the lowness set. So, but I don't assume tr any translational symmetry. So, and at each side, I have uh, one or even more creation and relation operators. So overall, you have this uh, car algebra. Um, and Hamiltonians are restricted to, because it's an interacting system just to this kind of Hamiltonian. So we have a sort of infinite matrix H. Um, which you can think of as a bounded operator from uh, L2 functions on this lattice to, 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 to themselves. Um, and uh, so then can, if you have a gap in the spectrum, then then you're some, um, some value. You know, then you can form the projector, uh, maybe not the sign, sorry, the, I should just, the step function, let's see. So, Sort of step function. Um, and then uh, this projector, uh, well, if the Hamiltonian uh, some has some rapid decay, and it's very important for all this business to assume that uh, all your terms in Hamiltonian have rapid decay. In this, in this particular case, it just means that this matrix H decays rapidly when X and Y far from each other. Then uh, this projector will also have the same property, it will also decay rapidly um, when the points are far from each other. And uh, it's, it's, it's very natural then to associate to this projector some element in the K-theory of some algebra of essentially, well, essentially algebra of matrices which have the same kind of property, they decay rapidly. And this algebra is known as uniform row algebra, but it's not quite the right thing to do in the sense that if you say that uh, you want to classify such projectors up to unitary equivalence and you don't get sort of the physically expected answer, but you do get it if you uh, instead pass to what's called the uh, uh, row algebra by sort of uh, stabilizing the problem by, sort of by, by adding a lots of sort of orbitals, enlarging the Hilbert space uh, on site to something infinite dimensional. Uh, and you can still think about uh, this P as defining a class in K theory. And then, well, so this K theory of this row algebra is actually independent of the kind of Delaunay set you choose in the end. So it's really gives a classification of these phases without regard to the. Um, a lattice, it just depends on the dimension of space. So some details of this picture are not, has a moment worked out, like some physical, mathematically it's, it seems pretty clear. Physically, it's some steps need some justification, but I, I think that that's a sort of, most people would agree it's the right thing to do. Uh, but when you go to interacting case, situation is quite different, but uh, so, but there is still some, uh, um, well, so many of the tools that you use for free systems just don't work here. So the question is well, what works? So uh, I'll have some thoughts later, but let's what's the problem. First of all, if we still want to focus on gap phases, even when we have interactions. And um, 
And physically, I should also stress that we want to only consider interactions um, in the Hamiltonian, which are short range, that is, they decay fast. Like uh, long range interactions are uh, totally out. We don't know how to deal with them. So let's not even try. And it's a very interesting physical question because in real life, there are, of course, Coulomb interactions. But um, uh, so looking at short, short range interactions doesn't mean that you have short range entanglement only. So entanglement is different from interactions. So even with short range interactions, you can have um, um, two different kinds of, and then you have energy gap on the spectrum, right? So, so you have two different kinds of qualitative different things, like uh, the one which I want to focus on, invertible ones, which sometimes people also identify with short range entangled, which although I'd rather not use this terminology, uh, and then non invertible or long range entangled in different terminology. Now, these are non invertible ones are more, much more complicated. Uh, and in particular, there's no like accepted picture really of what they, there's no even conjecture of what they could be, how they could be classified in an algebraic way. So there are some which understand better than others described by topological quantum field theory at long distances. But lately people have been talking about, they all discovered some other gap phases called, called fractons, which don't fit into this picture. So the question is totally open, like there's no conjecture as to classification of these uh, non-invertible phases. So the, for this reason, I, I'm essentially going to say talk about only invertible ones because at least there's a well-defined conjecture there, as we'll see. Um, but when some of the things I'm going to say actually have some applications to long-range entangled ones. So anyway, so we're interested in this set of uh, invertible phases in D dimensions. Uh, that is, your lattice is going to live in Euclidean dimensional space. And there's a similar set of invertible fermionic phases. I'm not trying to make be precise now. We'll talk about it. How to make this precise is a big problem when we'll discuss some approaches which could be taken, some viewpoints which can be considered for this. So, in the, in the problem in the first approximation is compute these sets uh, in all dimensions. Uh, we can also throw in some symmetry, but the most basic question is about situation without any symmetry. Uh, so, and by construction, so if we want to construct, uh, define the problems in such a way that these actually are going to be abelian groups. Now, uh, there's one thing which really helps uh, sort of to focus one's mind is yeah. Uh, do we know, or not sure if everybody knows what invertible phase is? No, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this. Ah, okay. But for now, there's some, some class of things which will invertible. I mean, part of the challenge is to actually define them, right? Uh -huh. And I'll find some approaches to defining them. But for now, let's just say there are some simpler ones. And loosely speaking, these are things which like in Lucas Stock, uh, it says they're not topologically non-trivial, like say local, they're not uh, non-trivial localized excitations. They're local excitations, but they all, uh, well, the localized ones are like the same as local. So no anions in particular, I think like in two dimensions, but in general, they, they, yeah. So there's no distinction between local and local, so the invertible roughly means. A Anton, yes. are you going to be interested in high dimensions? Because like, you know, up to dimension three, like if, if you just care about sort of what condensed matter people care about, then we kind of have a conjecture for what all the invertible phases are, and there's not that much going on without symmetries. So are you going to care about dimensions four, five, six, like? Yeah, yeah I'm taking more like viewpoints. It's just interesting to classify, even though it's not very physical, right? Okay. But uh, yeah, the problem is all defined in all dimensions. Sure. Yeah, plus when you throw in, sim uh, it's really, okay. So, so anyway, so one thing which allows, uh, helps is that uh, well, to focus one's uh, mind is this con Kitaya's conjecture, which we want to outline. Here. So could I argue non-rigorously that there is something, uh, some, there's some sequence of spaces or really homotopy types of spaces of, uh, separately for bosonic and fermionic case uh, labeled by dimension of space, like dimensional or physical space. So there's like X naught, X1, X2, with the property that the, so they all have marked points. And so consider base loop space for each of them. And uh, supposedly the, uh, the spaces satisfy uh, this relation, so the loop space of the K space is homotopy equivalent to the K minus first space. That's what uh, topologists call the, like the loop spectrum. The collection of the space is called the loop spectrum. And the claim is that there's such a, a loop spectrum such that um, uh, the, this set of phases just pi naught of the appropriate space. Uh, that's separately true for bosonic and fermionic cases. So it's a similar thing for the fermionic case. So then from this point of view, the, the problem is to like find this uh, spectra, okay? 
Now, in, in actually, there's a, a precise conjecture for what this is. I'm not going to say exactly what it is. Um, but basically, um, this bosonic uh, spectrum, or well, here I just dropped the subscript, uh, is related to oriented borders and spectrum in some well defined way. So there is some, I mean, in, in, in a loop spectrum, is related to some generalized cohomology theory. And bordism uh, spectrum is what's responsible for board, uh, cobordisms, right? But uh, the, the relevant spectrum is not quite that, but really some sort of duality to the bordism spectrum. And similarly, for the fermionic case, supposedly conjecturally related to the dual, sort of dual to the spin bordism spectrum. And um, according to Friedan Hawkins, uh, this spectra actually um, are classify in the same sense that is pi naught of them classify invertible unitary TQFTs up to homotopy. So if this conjecture were true, well, this existence of spectra as well as identification like this, that would show that all invertible uh, phases are actually described essentially by TQFTs, by unitary invertible TQFTs. Uh, so in non-invertible case, we don't believe that to be the case now because of these fraction phases. That is not all TQFT, non-invertible TQFTs are, uh, do not cover all possible uh, non-invertible gapped phases, but in an invertible case, it would be nice. Well, the no counterexample that the conjecture is right, that it should be corresponding between TQFT, invertible TQFT, and um, invertible phase. This is just in the case without symmetry, you're saying, but also in the case with symmetry? Or? And there's also symmetry. You can think, just think about, yeah, so you can take a, like a smash product with G. I see. So, so in that case, the the whole you can you can apply all these Fried Hopkins TQFT results to classify SPT phases yeah. with symmetries. Right. Supposedly, yeah. Supposedly, uh, if the conjecture is true, then uh, we have this wealth of you know results about all kinds of problems with symmetries too. So, just to give an example, what 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 is space is supposed to be like? Well, it's sort of zero dimensional case. This is kind of a bit boring, but still. Um, so if you look in zero dimensions, suppose that they're all non-trivial phases, but um, um, the the space itself actually not, is not trivial. It's uh, Eilenberg MacLean space. It's only non-trivial uh, uh, homotopy group is pi two equal to z, and the reason it's there, they have non-trivial space because you have a Berry phase. Even though there are no non-trivial phases of bosonic system in zero dimensions, they're non-trivial families. And you can, for example, you can have a, a two sphere of uh, gap trivial uh, bosonic system, which is not uh, contractible to, to a constant family. So and that's detected by the Berry integral of the Berry curvature. So that's why you get this KZ2. In fact, you get KZ2 just means that you have no other invariants besides Berry curvature. So there is more information in the spectrum that simply is well, it's information about spectrum that's good to keep in mind. So in one dimension, supposedly, well, again, actually, I think we know now that it's true, but um, suppose the space itself is KZ3. In that case, there is some that non, say could be non-contractible three spheres of uh, uh, invertible of, of one-dimensional gap systems. Um, and in two dimensions, now there's a finite non-trivial classification. In the bosonic case, there's an integer, single integer. Well, the space itself is like this. So you have um, a discrete label, but for each label, you have a non-trivial space. In that case, you have a non-trivial four spheres, say, of, one uh, of uh, system, uh, trivial systems. Right? Now, what is this integer? Well, it's supposed to be related to the chiral central charge of the edge conformal field theory. This chiral central charge also relates to thermal hole conductance of the bulk. It's a sort of bulk boundary correspondence here, which says the thermal conductance at low temperatures is linear and its slope is equal to chiral central charge of the edge. Of the That's related to the Z here. More so the Z, yeah. the Z does come out of this oriented borders in spectrum. It's not just something you put in by hand. No, it comes out of this, yeah, I want to think of this dual, right? So if, um, this duality is precisely, you know, uh, constructed so to reproduce all this thermal hole conductance, in a sense. Like in my, actually, uh, when I wrote, wrote first, wrote, I wrote a paper proposing this bordism related to this, X, to this type spectrum, I didn't know about this duality. So I just used the bordism spectrum and just put in this by hand, but uh, it turns That's out- paper I always look at. <laughs> but there's a duality, there's a dual spectrum, which has all the right things in it already. Um, so, um, let's see. So, uh, so um, the more precise chiral central charge is also divisible by eight. So, this in chiral central charge of the edge CFT divided by eight is this integer here. Is so, related 
E8 phase as well? Or? Yeah, the, the generator of the Z is just E8 phase. So famous E8 phase, which by the way has never been rigorously constructed. It's not a strange thing. Okay. In the Fermani case, there's also a Z, but there the generator is, is known. It's just churn insulator as churn number one or integer quantum whole system. In the bosonic case, nobody ever properly constructed this E8 phase, which is a generator of this integer. And what is the map between them? Is it multiplication by some integer? Um, yeah, so yeah, so we can uh, by eight. Yeah. Sorry, by 16, sorry, 16. 16. Okay. The charge here is one half. Like, uh, yeah. In the current case, it's integer multiple one half. Yeah. Okay, so by the way, I should stress that we don't expect periodicity in D. There's no analog of both periodicity. Uh, that's another prediction of this whole approach. But, so. Okay, so the key question though is what are we trying to classify exactly? So here I'd like to like advocate what essentially the viewpoint that Lukash was uh, describing, uh, but uh, it's been form formulated in a very sort of as a slogan by Xiaogan Wen and collaborators in his book quantum information meets quantum matter. It may, may be hard reading for a mathematician, but I found it very useful. Uh, so the slogan is that the quantum phase is a pattern of entanglement of the ground state wave function. And the fact that it's ground state, it's not like actually, you don't need to know the Hamiltonian. So, so we don't, uh, the important thing is just the, the ground state itself. Um, now, Another thing which I'd like to well, stress is that the distinction between phases, it's well known in quantum statistical mechanics that there's a sharp distinction between phases only in infinite volume. So in fact, the whole quantum statistical mechanics has been, have been, has been invented to, to account for this fact. So we should be working strictly in infinite volume. So instead of wave function, uh, one that talks about the pure state of some infinite system. So it's really a pattern of entanglement of an infinite, of a, of a state on some C star algebra, which, which we're after if you believe it into the slogan. So here's the, then the program. So first of all, we're gonna use quantum statistical mechanics. That's probably, that's probably a good idea in this situation, but ignore the Hamiltonian, just focus on the state, the state itself. Um, and um, we wanna classify invertible phases. Well, first of all, we need to understand what invertible phase is. So that's, uh, I'll propose some version, possible version definition, but uh, maybe it's other, some other approaches. And second, what is a phase? It's some equivalence class of states. Again, equivalence under what? Well, um, we'll discuss that, the one possible approach. But so so how, how is the, um, well, let, let's, sorry, so how the standard approach to quantum statistical mechanics work? So it's usually done for non phases at non-zero temperature, but how we can do just for zero temperature. So standard setup, well, if you don't have any symmetries, just have some, uh, Delona set and just a bunch of points and say, well, in this case, two dimensional plane, which uh, have some minimal distance between them and which don't, they're not big holes either. Um, and then on each side, in this lattice, you have a Hilbert space, finite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay. And then you form the algebra of local observables by, first of all, you first of all, for any finite uh, subset of this lattice, that will be say, you form uh, a tensor product of this finite dimensional star algebras, and then take a, a, a direct limit over all uh, finite subsets, and you get some star algebra, or the algebra of local observables. And then the next step in the standard approach is to take a norm closure, so to get the actual star algebra. So, so you have a norm, and take norm, it's not complete, but you take norm closure and you get C star algebra. So this is a, some very nice star algebra, like, well, not, it's not unique, there are lots of different choices of E, but it belongs to this nice class of uniform, uniformly hyperfinite star algebras. So, and then the next step in this standard approach is to take a continuous, uh, some line, a positive linear functional state, it's called a state on this algebra. But this algebra is called algebra of quasi-local observables. Okay, that's the next step. Well, once you do that, uh, then standard thing is to first you form a Hilbert space using the GNS construction. And you get a, from that a representation of the algebra of quasi local observable uh, in this Hilbert space. And then you have a cyclic vector called the vacuum vector. That's the standard approach. And uh, for zero temperature, we're interested in states omega, which are pure, extremal. And 
well, it's not, you would say that also ground state with respect to some time evolution generated by derivation. Can I ask just a question? Yes. The definition of this uh, direct limit, does it depend on, on how you approach? I mean, yeah. uh, lambda? By the way, one problem with this, uh, both with the, this guy and this guy, yeah. is that they really don't depend on much in the sense that uh, they literally, for example, if you take different um, lattices in different dimensions and say, so suppose this, uh, a, this VJ is all two by two matrices. Mm -hmm. So, well, there's no choice. So it's completely a canonical thing. You get some algebra. We just didn't care about which dimension you're in. Uh, so, yeah, so it, it, there's, no, there's no choice here, yeah. So the, the, the Vs, they are uh, just any choice of finite dimensional. They don't have all the same dimension or? They don't have to be, even though people like to take systems where all dimensions are the same. Well, for some purposes, it's convenient to assume that this dimensional V is actually bo uniformly bounded. But that's not strictly necessary. So there's no distinct, yeah, there's no, nothing, no, no depends. For example, yeah, so all this, um, uh, that, that's one of the problems. Because if, if you put it this way, it's not clear where the information about the dimension of, of the space is hiding, right? You want to classify the states after some equivalence. So what are we supposed to do? Well, well, usually people say that it, it, it's all hidden in the choice of the Hamiltonian or this evolution, which is generated by some derivation. Derivation is usually written like this. You take a, uh, some formal sum of local terms. Um, each of these terms uh, is in some, uh, this local, in this lo algebra local observable and take the infinite sum. Of course, the sum is not in the algebra, but uh, it might be defined as some derivation maybe on this your algebra of course, local observable like this with the dense domain, maybe, if, it's, uh, if there's some decay condition of this uh, infinite sum. Or you can also write it this way. You can write, maybe write it as an infinite sum just over lattice sides instead of over subsets. And then each term, which is going to be some quasi-local observable. And again, there's some, some condition that's approximately localized inside. And then if it, if it is a, a rapid enough decay, then this guy is going to define an unbounded derivation on some, you know, the main some dense subset as a local algebra. So in this approach, so this is a standard approach, but somehow that's not the right approach, I think, from this ideological viewpoint of quantum information theory. You don't want, you want to get rid of the derivation. Uh, and you want to, uh, then the only question, uh, so first of all, how do we, first of all, what does it mean to focus on invertible states? What are the special states we want to focus on? Which is not really clear here. Second, we want to define some equivalence of these special states and plus doing it all without, without all this Hamiltonian derivation. Now, actually, it turns out that um, this is uh, this sort of the most important thing is to define this, I think. The question? Part, yes. Uh, aren't you worried that if you throw away the derivation, then you will have too many states? Like, shouldn't we somehow restrict to states which, for which there exists some Hamiltonian? Yes, it's necessary, but we'll see that once you define equivalence relation, then you can also get some reasonable notion of an invertible state, which such that even though it does not, uh, does not have a Hamiltonian in it, it's guaranteed that some Hamiltonian exists. So the, the equivalence relation will be applied to all states, not just sort of area law entangled states, but you can in principle yeah. apply it to all states? This is the only part which uh, which might be relevant to say spaces topological order this uh, long range entangled state. And the notion of equivalence seems very nice, and uh, it's probably also useful for. It might even be useful for gapless states, for all I know. But like, I know. like I'm not, I'm even thinking about like an excited state at finite energy density. I mean, like some generic state in the many body Hilbert spaces. How? how... The, this notion, yeah, is completely general. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what it's useful for, but it's very general. The notion of equitable state. Uh, is is something more special in that yeah but it, it, so the, the most basic one the notion I think is defining equivalence and I think over the last couple of years we sort of understand better how to define that and I would say that the correct analog is uh, closely related to this finite depth quantum circuits but it's a kind of fuzzy analog of this uh, quantum circuits uh, and, and I call it uh, local generated automorphism it's basically a quasi debatic a continuation with some arbitrary sort of quasi Hamilton, nice quasi Hamilton, not arbitrary, but nice quasi Hamilton. This is inspired by this work by Ogata and Moon, 
above, which explains what happens if you have two gapped Hamiltonians, um, which are continue, uh, and two uh, with a unique ground state, which are connected by a path of such Hamiltonians. How are the two states related? And they're related precisely by this LGA. Well, not precisely, but wrong, basically. But anyway, so that's the inspiration for it. But I think technically, what, what, what needs to be done? Okay, once you drop the derivation, you need to put the information about geometry somewhere, for example, dimension of your space. It should appear somewhere. And there, I think the correct thing is to do the following. First of all, the key point is that quasi local observable is kind of boring object in a sense. This algebra doesn't carry much information. You need to put some other algebra which is in between local and quasi local observables. And it's kind of like um, if you think about quasi local observables as analogous to continuous functions, then this are uh, this was almost local observable, since AL is analogous to differentiable functions. The reason to do that is because even though such derivations, nice derivations, are still unbounded, uh, if you look at them as acting on the whole um, for the local observables, they don't they only have dense domain. In practice, we always work with some much smaller set of observables in which derivations are defined. So this, so this derivation is kind of like take like first order differential operators on, on, on functions. And we want to be able to, to, to work with them at all, you know, so that they're well defined everywhere. And we need to uh, sh shrink our algebra to something smaller. Um, and uh, technically, I think the right, well, okay, there could be different opinions how to do it. But one way is to just say, well, these observables, which are localized near some site of the lattice with very good accuracy, specifically, can be on a ball of radius R, they can be approximated by a local observable. Uh, with accuracy, which uh, is better than any uh, inverse power of um, of R, so not quite exponentially, but like decaying faster, the accuracy is getting better, better faster than any power of the distance. There's something distinguished about this, and by the way, similar things appear also in something called rough geometry, uh, which I learned about from reading uh, Alexander Engel's papers, and I think there is some a lot of truth. To this is the right approach. So because of this, this. Um, Okay, this algebra, even though it, it's it's not um, um, a C star algebra, it actually is a complete fresh air algebra in the end, so, which is a, it has nice topology. Kind of like uh, smooth functions uh, on the space also have fresh air, the natural form of fresh air space. So um, anyway, the point is that once you have a notion of this nicely well localized observable, you can form this nice Hamiltonian, which is a sums of such guys. And then you can consider evolutions using such Hamiltonians. And Lee Ro Robinson bound in, this, in the form of it says that these evolutions just map almost local observables to almost local observables. That's the key point. So the key point is that there is a notion of this fuzzy circuit which maps slightly non-local observables to slightly themselves, biotomorphisms. So this, this makes this, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's what I'm gonna call an LGA, some, uh, uh, local generative automorphism, something which um, basically fuzzy analog of circuit where it's a, it's a quasi evolution with some very nice Hamiltonian. Okay. And finally, I can try to formulate what it means to, to be in a trivial phase, which Lucas called short range entangled, and also to be what to be in an invertible phase using this quantum information framework that I'm going to replace like um, my. Um, unitary circuits with these fuzzy ones. So for example, what is a trivial state? Well, um, so it, 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 you have a state is in trivial phase if it can be disentangled by this LGA, but perhaps after tensoring with some uh, unentangled state, sort of the stabilization similar to what you do in K theory. So an entangled state simply factorizes pure state. They, they have this factorization property of two observables on different sites, then the expectation method just factorizes. Uh, so, so what does it mean that, again formally for state to be in a trivial phase? Well, if you can find some other system to, for the same lattice, but it doesn't matter too much. So it's the same lattice, but different system. So and some some factorized some unentangled state on this auxiliary system, so that the tensor product can disentangle it. It's, it's composition with some LGA is an unentangled state. Okay. And similarly. Um, if you have a, a kind of an invertible state, namely a state on this algebra is called invertible if there is some auxiliary system 
with some perhaps entangled state on that auxiliary system, such that the tensor product can be disentangled by an LGA on this composite system. So this, this guy is sort of the inverse to this one. So it's called invertible. So this, by composing this with this, you get something in the trivial phase. So Anton? Yes. Um, so, so I see. So this is a way of formalizing this idea of um, finitely generated or finite depth circuit with tails that decay faster than any power law. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a similar way of formalizing QCA, like a uh, QCA that decay, the QCA with tails? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm not, not sure, but say if you just look at automorphism uh, of this pressure algebra, almost local observables, that would be a candidate. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then you can take a question. Yeah. Yes, perhaps. There's an interesting question to how to classify this fuzzy cell automata. Right. Yeah, there's one kind of just look at the tomorphism of fresh algebra. And anyway, the, 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 the results for the, you know, systems without tails are the same as the systems with tails. I mean, W. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. In, in, in practice, actually, tails are kind of important. For one dimensional systems, bosonic system with symmetry G. Uh, they also work of Ogata and Born and fermionic systems, but I understand it uh, not, not as well. So, but anyway, the point is that this index is invariant under this LGAs. It's an invariant of a phase in, in this sense. In fact, I'm going to show it's a complete invariant of this invertible 1D phases. So, that's uh, amount of classification is invertible phases in agreement with what expected from uh, kinematic physics. Basically, it's a, a rigorous version of this Nayak Elsa kind of arguments. Um, this but, doesn't use matrix product states or any of that sort of technology. Uh, well, yeah, it's, well, it, it, it's not doesn't use any matrix product technology. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so matrix product states are examples of these non-trivial phases, and one can show that every other state can be. Well, one can show that every state which has a trivial class here can be disentangled after some stabilization of some unentangled system. This is rigorous, you're saying. So, yeah. Right. So, and that actually uses some other lots of tools of quantum information theory, well, basic ones, but still. Uh, uh, like for to these systems, okay, situation is not as good. But first of all, there is a, a rigorous definition of an index, essentially using this this approach. Well, essentially, like in, which can be shown to be also invariant to a phase in this sense. Uh, there is no result yet showing that's complete invariant, and in fact, it's not quite complete because we know that uh, there's also this thermal hole conductance, this Carroll central charge invariant. Which you don't know how to account for. If you assume that your system is in trivial phase, if you ignore the symmetry, then we expect this to be completely invariant. Okay, but that still hasn't been done. Also, whole conductance, if you look at cases where you want symmetry instead of finite symmetry, whole conductance of gap two systems can also be shown to be an LGA invariant. And moreover, it's even one can show that, uh, first of all, it can be defined for gap systems. That's indicate again. That's a good. That's some hint that maybe this equivalence of states actually is useful even, even for system with long range entanglement. It certainly makes sense for for system with long range entanglement. But then we can also show that for invertible three systems again, it's uh, quantized in the negative the expectations. So so it seems like it smells right. So and perhaps this is the, the approach to take. I'm not sure. I'm percent sure. Um, but the point is that it's quite different from non-interacting non case. Uh, say K theory makes no appearance. Uh, instead, the, the focus is on the special class of almost local observables and um, um, their uh, automorphisms. So I'm not sure if, if again, I'm not sure if that's the right approach. In particular, stabilization may not be quite the right one. So, so I'm not sure. Yeah. So not not quite clear. in one dimension. The stabilization I described is, is by, seems to be enough, but in the higher dimension, I'm not sure how how, how to stabilize properly to get the results which one wants. Is the two-dimensional stuff you, you mentioned about H3, is that kind of formalizing else and Nyack or is it a completely it is. different? It is, it is. It's not different. It's, it's formalizing else and Nyack. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, this result by themselves, crucially, the definition of the index itself depends on the fact that uh, we know all about one dimension. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, yeah. If you try to define it in, in saying extent to, to three-dimensional system, then we need to know first everything about two-dimensional systems, and we don't because the chiral central charge remains a problem. Nobody knows how to extract that purely from the ground state wave function. You just mean because you're looking at the boundary? 
boundary. There's no boundaries here. Yeah, we're just creating. We're just creating. Yeah, this uh, quasi one. Well, the first step is to act on this uh, symmetry element on a half space, right? Mm -hmm. Some two-dimensional states which is localized essentially in two dimensions, right? But and there's then, no physical boundary because Elsa Nyack has physical boundaries. But here it's all done in infinite volume. Well, one thing which should be stressed in this approach. Uh, you all work in infinite volume because once you find it, you can show that this indices actually are obstructions to having gap edge. Mm -hmm. uh, so you work all the infinite volume. You never take limits of finite volume systems because if you, whenever in finite volume, you have a danger that the system is actually gapless, right? Whenever in, in non-trivial SPT phase, you have gapless excitations. So but you never have physical boundaries either. Yeah, never have physical boundaries. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have physical boundaries, you're pretty much guaranteed to be in a trivial phase where you have gap, right? Yeah, so yeah. For, gap, for gap systems, uh, with gap systems or invertible systems in infinite volume throughout. So, so you somehow simulate the boundary then? I mean, like Elsa Nyack does have a physical boundary in your. Uh, I think one can reformulate everything as you say without having physical boundary, just by thinking about how you act by symmetry elements on regions in space. I see. I see. I see. And uh, say, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, I'll yeah, we'll we'll now when, when the floor is open for discussions, is this the floor is open? The floor is open. Yeah. Um, okay. can, can you just remind me how you stabilize and how what, what's 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 the abelian uh, group structure is exactly? Well, uh, when you have um, two uh, you know lattice systems, just two algebras in two states, you can just take here's an obvious monoid structure. Right? Well, it is obvious uh, uh, a semi group structure. You can just uh, Tensor the two C star algebras, right? And consider the tensor product of states. Also, oh, it's a tensor product, okay. Tensor product of states. Uh, now, just by stabilizing, uh, we want to say the following that if you, well, one possible way to stabilize, not necessarily the right one, say we have unentangled state on some uh, system, letter system, then uh, compose it with some other state, it's still in the same phase. Um, now, but some technical issues arise. Uh, for example, uh, it's not clear whether it's enough, to, it, it's okay to uh, restrict all Hilbert spaces to be finite, uh, to have uniformly bounded dimension. So, namely, in this one dimensional proof of completeness, because it was kind of crucial at some point to allow dimension which grow at infinity. I'm not sure if it's artifact of the proof or of our definition of stabilization. We also stress it in a uh, for free ferionic phases, uh, stabilization is more dr drastic. You use actually locally infinite, like use infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces on site. So, in my opinion, uh, Anton, if you go back all the way to where you define the, the phase, just the sets of uh, eh, over here, to me, I think we should rather be talking about an abelian group, we should be talking about a category. So, you just Define objects in morphism. Uh, um, well, that's quite possible, uh, but this probably can be maybe rephrasing that instead of working about this, uh, maybe we should be talking about this loop spectrum uh, rather than this. It's pi naught uh, because this is kind of infinity groupoid structure is naturally appears here, right? If you think about this loop spectrum algebraically. Uh, yeah, I think it was an infinite group void. But uh, for now, actually, I have nothing to say about how to form the spaces. But even though this, this conjecture is there, I still have no idea how to. I, I don't know if it can be made into something precise. For now, we just limit it to the, I mean, the, the definition I was proposing, which is quantum information theoretic, essentially, uh, has no topology in it. Right? So there's no the pure algebraic equivalence of states. There's no notion of a family of states, for example, or notion of a space of states. Uh, so for, to, to get the spaces, one needs to make, make sense of those things. Yeah. Um, isn't there some mismatch in uh, categorically speaking? Because in this uh, Kitaev conjecture, it seems like one will apply to a topological category. But in the free fermion approach with the row algebras and um, uh, what you just described uh, for the SPT phases, um, it's almost uh, something on a coarse geometric sort of category. So yeah. there's a bit of geometric information and it precisely washes out uh, the compact yeah. topological spaces, for example. 
Can you ask me like how topology of the underlying lattice somehow influences things? Yes, yes. So, um, so I, I, I am trying to see how, how a spectrum will appear if you were to, to pursue the, uh, the row algebra approach or the SPT phase approach that uh, we were describing I, in the last. Yeah. In the row algebra case, you have this K-theory spectrum, right? Um, and uh, the construction is, is somehow built so that this course equivalence, that is if you replace lattice by some course equivalent lattice, you get the same results, right? So uh, I'm not sure actually why it's- Right, why it's but um, it's not a purely topological category. Yeah, well, so course geometry is very coarse. I'm not 100% sure that this is the right thing in interacting case. Uh, some, I, for example, I, it's not possible to define this al almost local observables without putting in some metric information. Yes, exactly. So that, that seems to be a crucial ingredient in, uh, in yeah. your slides. Well, there's this uh, something called rough geometry, which you already mentioned. Yes, which yes. Perhaps more reasonable. Yeah. I should say coarse maps. Uh, there are lots of coarse maps, and uh, most of them have no physical. Right, right, right. These are not continuous maps, for example. They're not even like say one natural notion of a map between lattices is like a uh, called normalization group and you like bunch together a few sites right finite site number of sites one sort of super site that's a certainly yes, a small yes. map but the uh, course maps are just kind of completely wild and it's not clear why it's sort of an accident in a sense that in the free i think in the tracking case everything turns out to be a course invariant it might not have might not happen in the interacting case. I have no idea whether it does or does not. Thanks. So re regarding this stabilization, uh, why not uh, assume that these local Hamiltonians are valued in just in compact operators on some infinite dimensional Hilbert space on each side or something like that? Yeah, that's possible. Find that, track. That's possible. Uh, and in fact, they're trying something like this. Oh, I think we lost uh, Anton. To work, uh, maybe it's the right thing to do. I'm, I'm just not used to working with the uh, infinite dimensional on site field spaces. Another approach, which uh, actually Nikita, my student, is advocating currently, uh, and which I actually used in this, I think, in this paper uh, on the index and 2D systems, is uh, related to this. Right? It's uh, saying, just saying, let's imagine if, instead of thinking about system in D dimensions, let's think about system in D plus one dimensions, where everything is essentially trivial a away from some D dimensional um, hyperplane. Trivial meaning factorized. The state rapidly approaches factorized state, and so that's uh, uh, and then you work with LGAs which have the same property, which preserve this uh, structural state. Well, let me point out there are two hands raised: one from Ralph and from Michael. Okay, uh, so go first. Uh, Ralph, can you go first? Um, equivalence um, reminds me of the characterization of K1 uh, as automorphisms of vector bundles. So if you um, look at um, K theory, then <laughs> K1, just a moment, I have some disturbance. Maybe someone else has to go first after all. Uh, my family has just arrived. So sorry. Okay, then maybe uh, Michael can go first. Sure. Um... So I'm not super clear on the distinction between the almost local algebra and Ogata's quasi-local algebra. Um, could you say something about elements that appear in the quasi-local algebra that are not in the almost local algebra? Wait, what is exactly the definition of quasi-local algebra? Is it the same as which I call quasi-local algebra or something else? Um, almost. So I, I, I thought your definition was the almost local algebra um, and Ogata's was the quasi-local algebra. 
So quest local algebra is just norm closure of the algebra local observables. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. So that's a standard uh, thing, but uh, the, the advantage is that it doesn't run anything. You just use norm to conform this guy. On, on disadvantages is that, yeah. So there, so the, uh, that uh, your natural derivations are unbounded on this algebra and then mm -hmm. only to define. So how do uh, I, pro I propose to define the uh, let's do let's pick six some side j naught in this say in our lattice and let's define some accuracy um, uh, uh, which is unobservable uh, uh, let's do it like this so it's gonna be um, where b is observable which lives in on a ball of radius r right so let's define this accuracy function. And I want this accuracy function uh, to, um, to be, um, um, to decay uh, very fast when R goes to infinity. So I define then um, a norm, so a semi-norm like this um, for some natural number alpha as a supremum or or zero to one plus r alpha i r. So I want this to be less than uh, so uh, so so a is in you can define for example a to be this almost local to whenever this all these nor uh, semi norms um, uh, are finite. So, okay. So and then you can show that we can also define this as a closure of the local observables with respect to the semi-norms instead of just the usual norm. I see. Uh, it, yeah, I guess uh, correct algebra. It's inside uh, the quasi-local algebra. Yeah, it's inside so the it just, algebra. Yes, it's the domain of variation the, of, the, of the derivations. Uh, so this one sits inside the, inside the quasi -local. Yeah, the point is that for a large class of Hamiltonians, essentially all short range short, short interaction Hamiltonians, is actually one domain which works for all of them. Yeah. Oh. So as you vary your Hamiltonian, you might imagine you always stay in that domain, and uh, you know you have this nice picture then. That, uh, yeah. And this this domain, in fact, it's a it's a set of analytic vectors for these derivations, and right. you can find this in the book by Bratelli on dissipations and all of that. Nineteen yeah. on dissipation derivations. But basically, yeah, the fact that this, uh, yeah, that, that uh, the crucial point is the uh, crucial technical fact is that um, uh, ev evolving Hamiltonians, like Hamiltonian evolutions with this kind of interactions, preserve this algebra, and it's a Lee Robinson bound, basically. Mm -hmm. well, Robinson bound. Okay, thank you. That clears it up. And, and they also uh, uh, determine uh, the, the Hamiltonian and Hannah dynamics. I mean, they are actually a core for these operators for the That's derivation. And if you let them act on the vacuum vector, you get a core for a salvage on the operator. Uh, so like Anton says, it's uh, interesting that you don't have to know much about the Hamiltonian other than its, its locality properties for this to be true. Ali. Can I share the screen quickly? Sure. I want to show you a um, Thank you. A paper by Alain, uh, so where he says, has this statement, to put it dramatically, we could say that if we knew the thermal state of the fields around us, we could then throw away the standard uh, model Lagrangian without the loss of information. So he shows in this paper, very interesting, Tomita Takasaki, are we supposed to see something? Um, no, I don't see anything. Hi or not? No. Oh, maybe. I think about? Anton needs to stop sharing first oh. and then Emil shares. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Let's see. Let me see now. Okay. Maybe. okay, so it's a paper uh, um, with very simple calculations, but uh, quite interesting automorphism of a Neumann algebra and the uh, time thermodynamic. So it's the time which uh, it's, it's shown that is the, determined by the, the thermal state of a system. 
Um, but that's basically the idea that you, you have a modular Hamiltonian, right? So. And the key, the key here is that if you have a, uh, uh, a faithful state of a von Neumann algebra, then uh, you can push through the Tomita Takasaki theory. And he shows here that uh, there is a relation between the Gibbs state and this, uh, the, the, the modular automorphism group. And you can, you can actually reconstruct the whole Hamiltonian from the thermal state. Well, that's a well known, that's well known thing, really. Though. It's basically the fact yeah. that the psyche is equivalent to KMS. Uh, more, it's well known. So no, no, no. It's a, it, it shows that it, it it's it's the KMS state for the modular automorphism. But then, if you if you take one Hamiltonian, you define the Gibbs state at some uh, beta, and then uh, you construct the modular automorphism corresponding to this state, then you, uh, then you find out that the two, the two are related. So the uh, Unfortunately, it works only if the state is uh, separating. So if you, these uh, ground states that we are talking are not separating, so you cannot reconstruct, I think, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, dynamics out of the state. So you... oh, it's, it's, it's easy to see in many examples that the Hamiltonian is not unique, right? I mean, um, you can, yeah. you can look at the, 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 the state you're interested in as a gap ground state of many different Hamiltonians. That's right, so. Uh... Well, the point of this quantum information approach is that the state of Hamiltonians is convex. So if you're on, on, on classification of the homotopy, you can just ignore it, that's why. We can we are sort of uh, allowed to focus on the ground state itself because we have. To, uh, but I guess there remains the question, you know, whether there isn't anything about the existence of a local, a sufficiently local Hamiltonian, and that. No, definitely. Know, try to encode in different ways, and uh, for yeah. the moment we are all free to to sort of do it the way we want. Maybe, so, maybe I precise I, relations are not known. Uh, I should I should also say the punchline of that uh, of one of, of the Alain, Alain, Alain's result is that if you project this uh, automorphisms to outer automorphism caution by inner automorphism then uh, there is one fundamental automorphism which for each polynomial algebra which is independent of state Uh, I never seen anywhere uh, being used this uh, fundamental automorphism, but I think it's something to hang to it uh, and use it somehow in, in this program. Anyway, just to, to say that to, don't miss the punchline of the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, the, the question was raised. Yeah, we don't know how to characterize gapped states of like local Hamiltonians in a way which is pure in terms of pattern entanglement. So that's one problem. And with an invertible, it's easier because as I said, if you define invertible state, the way say I, I, using this LGA, one can show that it's automatically a ground state of some gap Hamiltonian with nice locality properties. So essentially you never need to use Hamiltonian. But if you just have a, if you hand me some, some, some state and ask, uh, well, is it a ground state of a nice local Hamiltonian within ground? I won't be able to tell. So it's very difficult to characterize uh, gap ground states of local Hamiltonians. But the equivalence of such states can be defined like in a way which doesn't require Hamiltonian. I'm just saying that they're related by quasi debatic continuation. Uh, right. Right. Maybe let me try to now idea. complete my remark, uh, which was interrupted. So I'm wondering about the following idea. If you want to define K-theory, then K0 with projection is kind of an exception. If you go to higher K-theory, then it's all done using homotopy groups of unitaries. And unitaries really are the automorphisms of, of well, any specific vector body. You could take a trivial one, which is most usually done, but you could also take non-trivial bundles. 
This reminds me of your emphasis on equivalence as the main thing. Maybe you don't have to look at which states are the right ones. You might start by looking at the self equivalences of one state. You didn't yet look at this, I think, but you might look at, well, different automorph or automorphisms that map one of these states to itself or some maybe unitaries which implement these automorphisms. This looks a bit now like K-theoretic stuff. And I could imagine that this is easier to classify and study than which states to look at. Um, this might also be linked to this idea of working in higher dimension and then doing something there, because this is a bit like taking a suspension and re replacing projections by unitaries and replacing, pushing everything into this equivalence instead of looking at the states themselves. You're absolutely right. Yeah, actually Nikita is currently working on something like this. My student, he is uh, now. Yeah, this, this viewpoint allows you to essentially trivialize the statement that Kitaev made about the loop spectrum, right? So he was ma he making a statement that uh, say a loop of uh, say k plus one dimensional phases is essentially the same as k dimensional phases. Uh, and if you think in, as, as we said in terms of automorphisms. Uh, preserving a state, you can actually make this essentially to, to, to stabilize using higher dimensional one, you can give it a tautology basically, um, which is a good thing. But Ralph, is there a way to build a Kasparov cycle out of just states? I don't see anything like that, no. I'm not aware of that. So, so we need more ingredients to actually place ourselves. Well, if you want Kasparov cycles, but uh, the classification that seems to come out in this interacting case using topological quantum field theories looks quite different from the usual key theory stuff. I wouldn't see any clear link to um, Kasparov theory in that case. Well, you will use the, the, the Hamiltonian itself as, a, as the elliptic operator somehow. Yeah, still these topological quantum field theories or even these, these borders in the spectra, they are not particularly close to Kasparov theory or K theory even. There are of course maps, but it's really a different invariant. So if that's the conjecture that you want to prove, then I would at least, well, well, I might be wrong because I don't understand it well enough, but my guess would be that uh, Studying more K theory, deep K theory, like Kasparov theory, doesn't doesn't seem to be a move in the right direction. Yeah, I think that studying this automorphism, this uh, automorphism of the Lib Lib Robinson property, is uh, like the right thing to do. I'm not sure what mathematical theories that is, but uh, that seems like uh, it's basically studying cell automate fuzzy cell automata. If you use uh, Lucas terminology, so how they classified. Logically. Does this Lee Robinson property uh, characterize these kind of automorphisms? Well, it depends. I'm just saying that it's an interesting problem to understand to, to understand topology of the group of this uh, automorphisms which which, which uh, have this Lee Robinson property. Let's see, uh, I'm not sure it has been done even in one dimension. Let's see. And unlike with, yeah, the, if you don't like, just look at the morphism, not preserving any state or anything like that. I'm not sure. What, uh, if there are any conjectures about what they should be, I don't know. Maybe Lucas can tell me, uh, tell us uh, whether uh, it's related to this Floquet phases which we've been discussing. Is there any conjecture regarding the classification of such uh, classification of Floquet phases? Yeah, I mean, some level it's classifying loops in the space of. Um, uh, these finite depth quantum circuits, or I guess these LDAs, as you want to call them. Yeah, but these are some conjectures about what the answer is in the end. Like what is? It? Oh, about what the what the answer is. Um, no, I think I usually ask, you know, people so, like you guys. I mean, these these um, class of automorphisms that that have this locality, this quasi locality property, you can generate them with basically any kind of uh, Hamiltonian with uh, decaying interactions, and therefore their classification is, I don't immediately see a difference with the classification of, of the 
the systems themselves. So they, they, these Hamiltonians are not physical Hamiltonians. They didn't, they didn't arise like that, but they are not different as mathematical objects. They're the same. And so uh, already that is, has the whole richness of, of in there. And then so whether or not, so that the question for, for the ground state and for the automorphism, maybe, the, you know, seems very plausible that's the same question, but it doesn't mean it's an easy question. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm sure it's the same. Like, for example, if you look at, say, automorphisms, which don't arise necessarily from local Hamiltonians, but do have the Lee Robinson property. So yes, there are such, yes. You want to classify these, say, automorphisms, modular, the ones which are generated by uh, by local Hamiltonians. This would be, uh, so the translation in 1D? Say, in 1D translation, yeah. it's a like example. But mm -hmm. usually people phrase in terms of some Finite range things can one do it in a fuzzy way and also like generalize to higher dimensions. Um, but I mean, for example, would people expect that if you're just studying automorphisms and sort of algebraic properties there? I mean, it's maybe not so surprising that you can get sort of these uh, group cohomology type invariants, but you know, it, I, I, uh, it seems less clear, at least to me anyway, that. If we really want to recover this entire uh, unitary invertible TQFT, I, I, I don't know if you, you can see that just from automorphisms or not, but I, I don't know enough to really say that. Well, it seems like a bit distinct but related problem. So those quite a, a few works on the, well, not that many, but some works on the index of this cell automata, mm -hmm. the tensor quantum information theory. But um, very interesting to have something similar for these fuzzy ones because it's actually physically more relevant. The quantum information theorists love this uh, cell automata, but it's the yeah, so for condensed matter physics, I think the ev evolutions or automorphic preserve locality are more, more, more important. But uh, I mean, it's it certainly doesn't suffice to classify only automorphisms, right? Because if you classify a phase, it also depends, you know, on which state the automorphism acts. The, the trivial phase being defined by those states that are reached by such local automorphisms from yeah. the product state. So there's, you, you always have to have those two in the ingredients in, in your definition. No, it's definitely a different problem. It's a different, but it seems to be, it's, it's, it would be nice to know the answer to both. That's all I'm saying. Maybe the one, mm -hmm. one helps the other. Because for example, of course. It seems like from the, okay, so this work on cell automata shows there's some relation between, um, say, cell automata in one dimension and, say, Carl's controlled charge in two dimensions. And if that's true also in interaction cases, it would be very interesting uh, also. And as I said, we're still lacking definition of Carl's controlled charge of a two-dimensional gap state purely in terms of the, the pattern from, from the pattern entanglement without actually going to Gibbs states or KMS states just from, from the ground state wave function. Maybe uh, it, it seems like, well, that uh, the index for quantum cell automata, one deal automata could, could be an ingredient. Oh yeah, Peter just posted a link to some paper. Yeah, Hamter, really, uh, which uh, does something like that, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I also don't know much more than the abstract, but that seems related to this. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. thing. I started lo looking at it, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, Same here. <laughs> it's not quite what I. My first impression, not quite what I would like to classify, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. So I uh, would like to mention a more pragmatic approach, which. Uh, myself and Bram took. <clears throat> we have all these uh, derivations which are local deri given by local Hamiltonian and on over some Delone set. On top of it, you this Galilean invariant, which gives you equivariance against uh, Euclidean translations. And these derivations have a common core. You can blow them up to a algebra inside the endomorphism over this common core. And we were able to characterize this algebra which emerges for uh, in the case of uh, 
particle conserving Hamiltonians. And this algebra tends to be what people call it's solvable by groupoid methods. So it is filtered by a, a sequence of, uh, of uh, ideals and the quotient of uh, uh, subsequent ideals is uh, isomorphic with the multiplier algebra of a well-defined uh, groupoid algebra. And this groupoid algebra grow as the number of particles grow. Um, but it, uh, it, we immediately can, at least for uh, n particle uh, states, we can, uh, um, we can immediately predict topological phases, and uh, basically, it's uh, uh, it, it's a it's a it's a way to uh, to use k-theoretic tools. So, although the algebra is huge, it accepts a filtration, and this filtration, in fact, uh, uh, enables the use of k-theoretic tools. And the Hamiltonian will not lead to just one invariant; it will lead to a whole tower of invariance, which uh, needs to be tested. So uh, uh, the idea exactly came from uh, the work of Jean Belizar, because what, and Johannes Kellen, what they did was for one particle systems, they really took these derivations, which uh, generate uh, the time evolution under the constraints we all know, and they show that, in fact, uh, this derivation uh, form a groupoid algebra. Um, so there is a there is a hope actually to 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 formalize an algebra for these derivations and continue to use these tools, the k-theoretic tools. I'm sorry for <laughs> self. Uh, uh, sort of advertisement, but um, uh, this will, it's, it's, it's one way, one way to, uh, to push forward with a K-theoretic program, NCG program. Maybe very slightly related to what Emil was saying, uh, the uh, quantitative K-theory approach, uh, you also have some filtration of the row algebras by the uh, according to the propagation length of the operators. So, so in, in order of ascending propagation uh, of, the, of the operators, you get a filtration on the, uh, the, the row algebra as well. So, so there is, yeah, so, so I mean, there's a program of this quantitative K-theory. And the uh, filtration by subalgebras or by ideals? Uh, ideals, I believe, yeah. Um, and oh, the... uh, wait, hang on. No. no, it's not ideal. It's not no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Subalgebra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vector subspaces. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This... Sorry. No. We got it's 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 more on the level of inductive systems. Sorry, uh, talking about these derivations. So one question which came up, if you'll, if you'll have a simple answer. So, you know, in the case of... Um, so which derivations of this uh, uniformly hyperfinite algebras are relevant, physically relevant, is a kind of difficult question if you phrase it in the, using this quasi-local algebra. So if you look at the unbounded ones, what which oh. Well, we cannot hear you. You broke up, huh? Anton, I don't know. The, the sound, okay. uh, maybe you're frozen. <laughs> My, okay, can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so my connection is not very good. So I'm just saying that there was a paper of Bratelli and Robinson which looked at uh, un uh, unbounded derivations with some nice properties, physical sort of properties, and tried to understand if they um, with, if they determined by it's the action on local observables. But actually, they're not, they're not the case. There's some bizarre examples of, the, uh, of these unbounded derivations whose domain is like larger than uh, local observables and actually which vanish from local observables, something like that. Uh, but um, it seems to me that if you look at uh, uh, derivations 
of this almost local world, which are continuous in the, in the, in the sense of the pressure topology, then actually they all should come from this local, nice local Hamiltonians. So, so this is some similar statement to what, well, this is a much more elementary statement by Sinai, I think that if you look at local observables only and look at finite um, derivations, which just map local observables to local observables, then they all come from Hamilton, local Hamiltonian. It's essentially an obvious statement. Yes, but even if you look from, so the local algebra, lo quasi-local algebra, it's the algebra of the observation and experimentalists can do. Well, the local one, like all in, looking at derivation, which we sort of you look at the whole quasi-local algebra, all interesting derivations are unbounded, don't define them densely. So the kind of question becomes, okay, what exactly, what, where is the domain? But suppose you look at this derivation which is defined on this almost local observables, which are very, very well localized and more of our continuous in this natural topology on these guys. I feel they should all come from local Hamiltonians. There should be no exotic stuff there. Yeah, should not, but uh, that's also from the physical point of view, because the local, because local algebra is the, observations that an experimentalist can do. He excites here and he sees how things evolve. Yeah, he but, can really measure a finite number of, uh, of uh, uh, Hamiltonian coefficients. And at the end, whatever you get from the experiment, it's uh, a, a local uh, finite, finite range Hamiltonian. And perhaps you can close that one a little bit, but uh, I think the very experiment dictates that this Hamiltonian should be local. Uh, but I think Anton is asking a, a clear mathematical question, and, and you know, we don't we don't have the answer, right? I mean, uh, no, if I'm there just... were these anomalous uh, automorphisms, if there were Lie groups of such anomalous automorphisms, then probably it would be generated by derivation that are anomalous. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, right? ah. That's, that's correct, but in my opinion, we should not, an experimentalist should not even care about those because we'll not well, be you, able to... Okay, but you, 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 don't, you don't, you know, I, when you're a physicist, uh, you want to avoid this controversy, of course, you, you're free to, you, you can, you know, you <laughs> look at systems that have a reasonable Hamiltonian and, uh, and then you don't have to worry about it. But when you formulate it as a mathematical classification question, then, well, then these things come up. <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, in, in another related question, well, somewhat related. The question is, um, so this is nice uh, class of this Lee Robinson evolutions, uh, which uh, some nice automorphisms, uh, which uh, act on this almost local observables. So it's, in some sense, this is similar to like diffeomorphism group of some manifold or something like that. But the diffeomorphism group of manifolds is actually a, a Lie group or Fraschel Lie group. So I have no idea whether there is any nice topology on this Lee Robinson automorphism, which makes it into a, like, say, Fraschel Lie group, which would be natural. Yes. We would like to say that it's Lie algebra, is this Fraschel Lie algebra of these nice derivations. Uh, but uh, even that is kind of hard to make sense of and uh, really nice to, to give it some Lie group structure. So. You know, it's non trivial for the diffeomorphism group, is not obvious, it's not highly an obvious fact that uh, uh, it's actually a freshly group. Um, well, in one afternoon, I asked uh, Nigel, uh, What's the situation with differential operators over a manifold? Because they are at the end, they are all derivations, and and it's understood that even in that, in that context, uh, it's, you have to approach one by one <laughs> the, and the, the, the situation can be as complex as you can as you as you can imagine <clears throat> or if I could ask an unrelated question so at the end of your presentation Anton you gave uh, these indices for low dimensional bosonic phases. Are there also fermionic results in that direction? Yeah, I just omitted them. Uh, but uh, this is a paper of uh, Ogata and Born on the, on the fermionic 1D case. So uh, it's a bit different framework, but the results can be restated also in the framework I was advocating. So, so they use some approach based on von Neumann algebras. Mm. 
So, uh, by the way, I, I'm not completely sure. Like in my presentation, I de-emphasize the role of GNS representation. And I'm not sure it's even necessary to ever in this business to consider GNS representation, or in fact, this algebra of quasi local observables. It seems mm. like it's too big and not even important. Well, I mean, to answer for Emil, I mean, it's, it's a very natural space of excitations to look at. These are, you know, that's where you can see the spectrum of that you would see in physical experiments of the system. And so, wouldn't you be interested in seeing the spectrum? Or, uh, probably. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Like, uh, you may not need it for, for, for some of these considerations of classification, but uh, it is certainly uh, uh, the natural Hilbert space, I think, where uh, that may co close context with the, with the physical situation. Yeah, there is, I mentioned because uh, this paper of Ogata and Born is formulated in the context of genus representation for non algebra like on this Jonas Hilbert space. And I'm not sure, actually sure how to reformulate it purely without that. So I'm not completely convinced it can be done in a natural way. So maybe, maybe there's some role for general representation for harmonic case. It's more complicated. So I didn't want to touch on that. But technically, I mean, there's no like particular issue. Just like you know, just look at graded product of this super matrix algebra. You get some you get the same thing. So, Would you have yeah. I agree that uh, probably there is no uh, uh, well, it's just a pro probably a matter of working out the technical details, particularly with this Z more two grading, but I, I guess I can't say for sure. Yeah, and by the way, that paper also deals with anti unitary symmetries. It's uh, like getting more and more complicated. The actual classification for one, the reason I didn't want to write it down because even stating what the class, the in, where the index takes values is rather, <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe you have some better way of stating it, but. Uh, it's no, no, not really. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, write, writing down the index is kind of an involved uh, procedure uh, and how they step and how they compose under stacking is even worse. But uh, I mean, okay, it can be done. Um, but can it be done, whether it can be, be done in a maybe more palatable way is, well, I'm, I, I guess I don't know right now. Dimension no. one plus one, right? right? Yeah, this is just, and this, and this is also just dimension one. Um, I guess, I mean, okay, it's for split states. So you could ask for um, uh, uh, higher dimensional states which satisfy the split property that um, actually Peter did not talk about, but uh, uh, you can, factorize them into cones, but uh, that's a pretty special class of states, which you would not expect uh, to be uh, valid for a lot of uh, ground, gap ground states in 2D and higher. Yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, it, in two dimensions, it gets more complicated. I guess that's why this recent paper of Ogata just dealt with bosonic case. Even though in principle, the methods should presumably work also in the permonic case for, for, the, for the two. Yeah, I mean, if you believe the, uh, I mean, so when and others have already given their predicted invariant in terms of some Z2 graded cohomology, but uh, um, working out all those details rigorously is probably a very involved task. Yeah, just, even forgetting about the stacking, it's already rather than trivial into two plus one in two dimensions. Just the, the, the set itself. The set is already yeah, it's not mm -hmm. sure the super cohomology makes appearance. And, um, so the the set you're talking about that it takes, for example, in one D, that you get these triples. That's what you mean, right? Or no. of three different cohomology groups, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But they they are, I mean, they're one way to say what this boredism group is, right? I guess. Well, yeah, this is just a covariant spin boredism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, this is just spin borders on BG, basically. Um, but it's obvious, yeah, it's a kind of, uh, yeah, so in principle, this conjecture, it's agreed with the conjecture, but the way it arises from lattice model is completely uh, different. You don't see any connection with borders. It just comes, on one hand, there's spin borders of BG, which is not so easy to compute. On the other hand, there's this lattice definition of indices, uh, like in uh, Kripp's and Agata's paper, and the fact that they come out the same is a highly 
an obvious and uh, yeah. hmm. so I mean, the relation should be the Atiyah Singer or the what am I saying the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence I guess yes I mean that that that's the reason that these three cohomology groups appear that they're the second page of the yeah well that's how they appear in the in the borders of approach which is conjecture yeah. Yeah, but there are no spaces uh, in this lattice story so far. Should be some space of states in some sense. How to define it, uh, anybody's guess, I don't know. But at least I, you- can... Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna switch topics, so go ahead. At least you can then like identify, like if you have a certain degree cohomology class, you can sort of see to which co-dimension defect things correspond maybe. Yeah, no, so that certainly can be done. Yeah, but that's kind of known, like on the handling level, on the physics level of rigor, we all know how, how the, what these classes mean. All right. So I was going to say, um, it seems like, you know, in the general classification of SPTs, um, it's not just these sort of uh, uh, fuzzy versions of, of finite depth circuits that should make an appearance, but also QCAs because. And we have an example of this, this Elsenayak procedure, you know, it sort of constructs a, a cascade of these ever lower dimensional um, locality preserving unitaries, you know, there's this boundary action of the symmetry and then sort of lower dimensional ones. Um, for group cohomology phases, all of these things are finite depth circuits, uh, but that's sort of an assumption. Um, and, you know, we can construct examples where they, at some level of this sort of hierarchy, they stop being finite depth circuits and, and then that, precisely corresponds to, we think, um, having a beyond cohomology phase of some sort. So it seems like the classification of all phases, including beyond cohomology phases, QCA somehow naturally make an appearance, you know, the sort of having locality preserving unitaries, which are not finite depth circuits. And, you know, when something's not a finite depth circuit, it means it's not truncatable and you can't go to a lower dimension. Uh, so that's, that's sort of a very technical thing, but, but it just seems like fuzzy versions of QCAs will somehow also be necessary in jet you know to construct a general classification of spts and make it sort of correspond to the uh the borders in one yeah that's one viewpoint another viewpoint is what we're missing is a proper understanding of just the uh, chiral central charge in two dimensions just to move one dimension up to three dimensions so uh, like, namely suppose you do apply symmetry symmetry um on just a half space in three dimensions so you, so well since the state was invariant, supposedly, mm -hmm. the state is still uh, um, unchanged, except on this hyperplane. Mm -hmm. Hyperplane, though, you might have something with an untrivial chiral central charge, now, which cannot be disentangled anymore. Now, if you understood what this means exactly, maybe that would allow you to, to, to push through and figure out the index for three-dimensional states. But uh, uh -huh. Currently, there's no information theoretic definition of the chiral central charge. You, you know, the example I was thinking about it was actually in four dimensions where the boundary symmetry action acts as a non trivial QCA. So it's a Z2, the young cohomology phase of a Z2 symmetry in four dimensions. It might also be related to chiral central charge stuff, but I, I don't know. It, it seems kind of a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah question for uh, Bruno. So in your, in your study on the stability of the anion structure in the Tori code, can you re remind us what were first, what was, what were the conditions in which the stability uh, holds? Yeah, I can and, certainly answer that. Actually, we should ask Peter. Um, ah, he mentioned this word. Right, and, right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a partial result. It only, only covers in, in its totality, but there's, yeah, there's a, a bunch of, it, it depends what you want to assume, but I, sh I think Peter should speak. Anyway, uh, what is your impression? Uh, is it a robust feature or, uh, it's a fragile feature just if, it, if there are gaps, if they're gapped, they're definitely robust. I mean, it's, and, okay, you know, robust. No robust. doubt about it. Mm. Robust even to uh, change drastic changes in lattice. Uh, well, 
Yes, you you are you are a very violent man. And, and no, I, I'm too, <laughs> but violence, so I, that's why I asked you before. So what what exactly? How how much do you want to do? <laughs> no, but uh, see, Anton puts it in such a general case in this uh, row. Okay. okay. Of course, geometries that the, the points don't matter where they are really uh, in in space. So uh, that's. Maybe I mean, there's many things I can let you do. I'm very confident that the, the structure is entirely stable. But where are the boundaries of this? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of hard to describe. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the results that we proved they are they are for you know fixed systems. But but it's clear that you know what there's all kinds of details that don't enter and we could modify. Um, and you modify the Hamiltonian. Yes, you can definitely modify the Hamiltonian. Um, in fact, we, we have explicit examples of that. I have a paper with a student where, where we do that because it's kind of interesting to, to see whether the, when these anions um, we get a non-trivial dispersion relation, they can form bound states, um, which under certain conditions, we change parameters in Hamiltonian, the states uh, unbind, mm -hmm. but the nature of, of the uh, structure of the, the uh, the tensor category does not change. I mean, the nature of the charges and how they compose and how they fuse and that, that, that does not change. Even though in some Hamiltonians, they may, fusion may be sort of implemented as actually forming bound states or in others it doesn't, but it, uh, that the, the, the formal anion structure is not dependent on that. I mean, that's what we found in some examples I and mean, we studied in, in, in detail. I don't know, Peter, you want to say something? Oh yeah, I, I agree with this. I mean, you also expect this because uh, these model tensor categories that describe the annuals, they are very rigid structures. So you cannot basically cannot deform them. So yeah, you have to do some pretty violent stuff to, to, to break that. Um, yeah. But uh, coming back to uh, chasing the space. So I know, um, so Reinhard Werner is, is, is done, done uh, some work on, uh, I mean, I don't think it's published yet, but he's trying to capture this uh, uh, using coarse geometry. So this this kind of like this locality of automorphisms describing it as a coarse geometry so that you kind of get this geometric picture back. Um, it seems kind of kind of interesting and a natural thing to do. Because I mean, it shouldn't it shouldn't depend too much on, on the local structure of the, of the system. So that's, that's uh, yeah. But as far as I know, this is not published yet. I don't know much more about this. But yeah, seems to tie in with some of the discussions we've been having. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely things to be discovered, the limits of it. But in terms of the, the Hamiltonian setting, of course, if you if you start closing the gaps, then we know, of course, you uh, you have the possibility of quantum phase transitions. Um, and um, uh, you can easily enter another phase. Um, it doesn't mean it necessarily happens. I mean, it, it, whether there's a gap or not is a little bit of crude characteristic. Um, no. With the spectrum of a many body system uh, is, is sort of a composition of, of many, many layers. And so you, you don't necessarily see what happens in an individual layer if you just say the gap closes. So, so but in terms of a, a stability statement, as long as there's a gap that doesn't close, then, then you know it doesn't close anywhere and, and there will be no transition and you will have very, very general robustness of this whole structure. Um, how can I ask? I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask if anyone has an opinion on whether results are going to drastic, drastically change if we allow some uh, long range interactions, because then in the real life, there are of course Coulomb interactions. I'm not sure, is this whole picture supposed to be like just useless? Will this method supposed to be useless? Or on the contrary, we expect not much will change. So from physics, physics wise, I mean, are there any, I don't really know anything about this. You can work with screen Coulomb interactions, right? There's always I'm a not sure. Why it's okay? 
Like, why is it okay to just say, oh, well, it's all screens, so I can work with exponential decay? Well, I mean, just, just imagine like something extra that's screening the interactions. I mean, this is maybe not very physical, but just like a conducting plane or something. No, but, but people can build systems where there is no screening, right? There's no, uh, sure, sure, sure. Of course. Of course. <laughs> so I mean, then, and then the question arises. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so in that case, I think what will save us will be a reference state, which we understand very well, and we'll just dance around the reference state. I want to know, like, what, 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 what we expect some totally new new world for, uh, to open up suddenly if we just abandon this short range interactions assumption. Or... No, it's a it's a it's a good question, and um, so, um, but yeah, it's, the, the, the techniques are already it's already difficult to to push them to the limit. I mean, there's probably some power law um, with a high enough exponent that would guarantee that everything stays the same, which will not include the core law, of course. Um, but, but even the techniques to do that, we don't really have to, to go to the bottom way, I think. I mean, at least I, it's not, has not been done. Um, Coulomb is slow. Coulomb is huh? slow, none of the methods. Yeah, when, whenever you have Coulomb interaction, it's just- Coulomb it's is just... definitely too much and probably different things happen, I would say. <laughs> But if they are sufficiently summable, you have a couple of moments um, of the interaction decay, and, and then everything will be the same, I think. So I don't think you need, uh, you know, faster than any power um, to describe the locality. I mean, it's a very nice class to work with, but uh, it's, um, so we don't know how. I'm not sure we will we will know soon because um, these cold atom systems and optical lattices and things like that they have power law interactions but um, they're they're not Coulomb systems generally <laughs> they're neutral atoms and you can tune all kinds of things but uh, the, so the powers are higher. I don't know, Lucas. Do you know of anything that would I mean, trapped ions, you know, charged ions, obviously in one D, but that's not okay. That's one D. Um, well, it's pretty, it's, well, 1D, but still, 1, one or R decay for interaction is very slow for 1D. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, very has this problem been solved in 1D? I mean, has, has it seems like 1D is sort of analytically maybe the most tractable. Well, I'm saying for, for like, for example, all kinds of results, like a lack of phase transitions of positive temperature or whatever for 1D, they'll break down for such slow decay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. The, what do you mean? They do break down, yes. Yeah, they do break down. So even yeah, like the pulse so, base things break down. So as yeah. for <clears throat> who knows? Right. Um, yeah, I think you should expect something new. We, we don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody ever seen it. Well, all, all we see is kind of we don't see anything very dramatic, even though there are cool interactions in nature. So presumably there is some some way around this difficulty. I mean, all the fractional quantum Hall phases are realized with Coulomb interactions, right? Yeah, so I don't understand why Coulomb interactions is important. Even though I talk to like a, some non-mathematical physicists will say, well, your theory is based on short-range interactions, so it's all useless. Well, your, your theory didn't have much of a Hamiltonian. Of course, we don't agree. <laughs> no. And all I'm saying is that, you know, suppose we prove all this conjecture and stuff like that. First thing you'll hear probably, well, how do you include Coulomb interactions? No, I, no look, um, well, um, well, everything has its limits of applicability, whatever theory come up. So it's, uh, um, Condensed matter physicists have done a lot with um, screen Coulomb interactions. Right. <laughs> they, they are the real thing, and it, as far as everyday condensed matter physics is concerned. So. That is a starting point for a lot of, you know, phases, right? You just have I just feel like liquid. Some, some way, there should be some way, which is less hand than we usually do to justify this statement that all the pressures are screened, everything is okay. Yes, well, oh yeah, well, that, yeah, there is work on that. Um, not easy. Um, but there are surprising results, for example, in 
heart of fog if uh, in, in a crystal if you put an impurity you'll find that it's not fully uh, uh, fully screened so there is a tiny charge which remains on screen and these are rigorous results by Lewin and Eric Kams quite interesting why is that there are some trace uh, uh, trace conditions, which uh, if they are not satisfied, then you don't have full screening, and if not, and they just identify certain conditions in which those trace conditions don't. And uh, the way the way it works when you put the impurity, you. Uh, you sort of change the, the C of electrons, the occupied C of electrons so drastically that at the end it, uh, it might uh, lead to this anomalous effect. That was my understanding. So was this in, uh, related to experiments? Was ex no, this is by... just a rigorous Hartree-Fock uh, uh, Hartree uh, theory, infinite, infinite volumes. Right. Well, I know they, 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 they like to study Hartree Fock. So I, I'm, I'm not, but okay. So Hartree Fock is used in. in so this is just an effect time, of Hartree Fock, so. or is this an actual, like the, the, the property of the true solution? Ah, yeah. <laughs> no, we don't, I, don't, I don't think we know anything about that, right? Well, this, uh, I mean, the, it's a regular crystal. So I will, I will unless. You put this crystal under uh, stress conditions. I will. I will assume this will have just a Landau Landau Hamiltonian, which can be connected to a, to the to the Hartree Fock ground state. So in so in that case, I will say uh, um, I will expect this one to to hold. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't know the details of that. <laughs> so, um, I, I guess I, the question is like, is, are these short range entangled states that you know, Anton, you're, you're working with these short range entangled states. I mean, are they? Do you expect these to be more or less the ground states of, you know, things with long range interactions, or do you expect some qualitatively different ground states? I mean, fractional quantum, well, yes, go ahead. Can you repeat the question? Just, uh, I was just wondering, you know, I mean, you're, you're working with this concept of short range entangled states, right? You're trying to formalize this, this idea of short range entangled states using these, whatever, this equivalence relation. Mm -hmm. um, so with, you know, with, with Coulomb interactions or things like that, do you think that there's just some completely new class of states you have to consider? I mean, some something that has more entanglement or something or, or well, maybe maybe uh, short-range okay. angle states are good enough, and then it's just the same thing. Well, I later have no intuition, but it seems like all technical tools you use uh, stop working when you have, a, let's say, a low, especially a long-range interaction. Uh, so, like, if the interaction is like okay, below like some dim faster than say dimensional space or something like that, then it should be okay. But uh, as soon you're slower than that. It seems like uh, you can have all kinds of different phases, presumably. Just, I, I really don't understand why one would expect the results to be the same. Well, I mean, I guess maybe, maybe you can just think about it as you're, you know, you're sort of splitting the problem into two steps. First, you're classifying short range entangled states. That's one problem, and you're solving that problem. And then there's the question of, you know, does that classification apply to understanding sort of short range Hamiltonians? Does it apply to Sort of slightly longer range Coulomb Hamiltonians. I mean, but there's two separate problems, right? No, they, they are. I'm just, just not, not, not sure how realistic all this. I mean, yeah. I'm not even sure how to approach this because uh, perturbative, well, people like to treat Coulomb interaction perturbatively, but it's not not clear why, why it's justified. And if you do it non perturbatively, then they say all these technical tools just don't work. Like, uh, Libro, like none of none, none of like things, things like Librovans and or anything just holding them. That's right. 
I think in condensed matter systems, often, you know, like a good starting point is, um, you know, this, this, this Fermi liquid of electrons interacting via screen Coulomb interactions. And then, okay, that's just your starting point. That's your sort of Hilbert space. And then you sort of look at, at low energies, what states you can, you know, achieve from that. So, so you've sort of eliminated, you know, the, this plasmon mode has just been eliminated from the get go. And then you know, you're just sort of looking at that as your sort of starting Hilbert space. So it should apply to that situation. I mean, not, not more generally, but just to that situation, right? No, I guess that's a good answer. Like if you like have some media hater who'll say, why working with short range, short range interactions? So, well, because it's already effective Hamiltonian. So right. it's not with Hamiltonian, so I'm okay. But there's a more general question, of course. I mean, that's, that's. We'll have to leave that one for another day. <clears throat> okay, so maybe it's a good point to terminate the session today.